on the video format, whether you are on LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter, etc. And thank you to our listeners for tuning in yet again to another To Be Blunt podcast episode where we are talking about cannabis business and marketing. Y'all know those are my favorite subjects to talk about. And today's guest came to me in a very uh, unorthodox kind of way, but I think also very serendipitous way, right? I think that's just the power of LinkedIn. And I think you guys have heard me echo the power of LinkedIn. So if you're a cannabis business operator, professional, you need to be on that platform. You need to have your profile set up. And so really I... I'm a business owner, as you may or may not know, and I was personally having a challenge trying to navigate some, you know, qualms and confusion around certain labeling and words I can and can't say as it relates to regulation and compliance. And I like to think that I know a lot of things, but as we're going to go on this journey together, there's still so much more to learn and to unpack. And so a very kind person introduced me to today's guest, Marty Marion, and we had a quick little conversation. I shouldn't say quick. We had a pretty in-depth conversation, but now we're going to do like part two and obviously open it up to my audience and platform to benefit from the insight that you have accumulated over your many years navigating marketing. I know you have done a lot of work uh, from a pharmaceutical perspective. You're back now in the cannabis space. And so I just want to say welcome to the show and please start off by introducing yourself. Tell us, you know, what you have done in your past and what has, um, you know, evolved into, you know, presently operating and having this conversation today. So welcome to the show, Marty. Thank you very much, Shade. It's absolutely wonderful to be here. And um, I'm thrilled to be doing this with you. And thank you for all the help that you've been bringing to the industry. You know, probably better than most people that this is an industry that is rife with confusion, misinformation, compliance, three-letter agencies, state regulations, federal regulations. It's absolutely a disaster. And one of the things that I have found is that even a little bit of clarity can make such a huge difference in the way anyone in this industry, in this business, whether it's the cannabis industry, the CBD industry, or any of the related industries, achieve success. You can struggle or you can sail through. And objectively, my approach has always been one to outsmart the market instead of having to outspend the market, right? We're not all able to avail ourselves of unlimited bank accounts, right? Where we can do all the advertising and all the marketing and pay all the fines and not really care. So we've got to be smart about what we do. And the more we know, the safer we can be. The safer we can be, the more successful we can be, and the longer we can survive in a very confusing and very, let's say, dynamically changing market, right? A little bit about my background. I come from, originally, the gigantic New York City Madison Avenue ad agencies, the stuff that the show Mad Men was created about. I was a principal of the agency that that show was built around. And we had, I think it's pretty fair to say, almost every major pharmaceutical company as a client. Merck, Pfizer, Eli Lilly, you just name it, Glaxo, Smith Klein, on and on and on and on. And in the pharmaceutical industry, it can take three years, four years, five years, 10 years to bring a new drug to market. And in that time, simultaneously, the marketing of that product starts to get planned. And pharmaceutical products are highly regulated, as you well know. So working with agencies like the FDA and the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, and other three-letter agencies, before the products get finally approved and come to market, gives these companies the opportunity to hit the ground running. The day the product gets approved, it's in the market, the TV commercials start to roll, the print commercials start to come out, and the marketing goes. So I had an opportunity 
to work for many, many years, almost on a daily basis with the FDA. So I learned from the inside that there's a huge difference. And this is something everybody in this industry needs to understand. There's a huge difference between what the regulations actually say in writing and the way the agencies operate in the real world. So I'm going to focus today on using the CBD industry as an example, but the premises apply equally to the cannabis space and to any regulated industry. So that's a little bit about my background. Over the last 20 years, I've been doing consulting for primarily originally supplement companies. I left working with Big Pharma. Wasn't really happy with the Big Pharma attitude. You know, back in the day, and I'm dating myself, pharmaceutical companies developed great drugs to treat really serious diseases. And then at some point, they started to create diseases to sell more drugs. That didn't sit right with me. So I transitioned my expertise to work with supplement companies, natural health product companies. And then all of a sudden, we had this thing called CBD and the farm bills starting to come along. And I saw an opportunity. I'm a big believer in natural health related product. And I saw an opportunity to use this expertise that I had acquired over decades to help companies just coming into a crazy, ridiculously regulated and confusing space, stay safe. And so that's a little bit about my background and how I got where I am. I do have something brand new. I'm going to brag for two seconds here. Please do. Um, I have become recently the CEO and president of a company that we just took public that makes a CBD hemp smokable product, a hemp smoke. And I'm biased, of course, but it is by far the most delicious, smoothest, most amazing hemp smoke ever made in the history of hemp smokes. And I'm very proud of it. It's called Mountain Smokes. Um, so that's where I'm putting my emphasis today. But I couldn't resist the opportunity, Shada, to get on with you and do this podcast because I'm I'm such a fan of what you're doing and so supportive of how you're helping this industry that I wanted to take the time to contribute a little bit of my expertise to your market. Thank you so much for that introduction. It is so prevalent, just everything you're saying. It's like constantly, I feel like being swirled around our faces as operators in the industry. And yes, there's just so much confusion when it comes to how do you take the next best step forward. And I think to kind of like get a little bit of clarification from you, I wanted to understand, and maybe it's a short answer, maybe it's a longer answer, you're talking about obviously like pharmaceuticals and the relationship to the FDA, other three letter agencies. I understand from a medical perspective why there are certain, you know, precautions with saying certain words, um, certain guarantees about a medicine performing or not performing, obviously all the, you know, non-disclosed or, or, you know, slowly disclosed at the bottom of a screen side effects that are happening. How does that mirror or like, why is cannabis, why is CBD in the same conversation as these pharmaceutical companies? That is really a great question. And it cuts to the heart of the whole ball game here. So the government, and I'm putting that in quotes, all these agencies exist for one purpose, and that is to serve and protect and safeguard the public. And at the bottom of everything is an assumption that the greatest majority of consumers, the public, 
are not professionally medically trained. I'm not a doctor. You're not a, an MD. The majority of people aren't MDs. And the government takes the position that only a properly medically trained professional can make an intelligent and accurate diagnosis of something. So let's pick one of the common ones, pain. If you look at all the CBD products that are out there on the market today, the greatest majority of CBD marketers have a product that's targeted at pain, relieves pain, reduces pain, treats pain, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Whether it's a tincture or a topical or a gummy or an edible, whatever it is, every CBD marketer has a pain product. Well, pain by itself isn't really a disease, it's a symptom. But it's a symptom of a lot of different things. The average healthy, normal human being doesn't wake up every day in pain. If you do, something's wrong. The average healthy, normal human being doesn't go through their whole day in pain. If you do, something's wrong. And what FDA says is, you're not a doctor. You're not qualified to determine what's wrong. Is that pain in your side, let's say, or in your back, the result of a tumor or cancer? Or did you just work out too hard? Did you twist yourself the wrong way getting out of bed this morning? Oh my God, it hurts. And you're not a doctor, so you're not qualified to make that decision. So you need to go see a doctor to determine whether that pain is the result of something serious that needs medical intervention or not. If I slam my elbow on the side of my desk, which by the way, I do at least once a day. Me too. It hurts. I'm in pain. But that pain is not caused by a disease. That pain is caused by stupidity. I wasn't careful. I slammed my elbow. Wow, it hurts. Do I need to run to a doctor? No. I rub it. I put some ice on it. It goes away in a few minutes. So what the FDA did back in 1994 was create a series of regulations called the Deshaies Regulations, Dietary Supplement Health Education Act. And what it says, and you've all seen the FDA disclaimer, these statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This product or these products are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. So by saying the phrase relieves pain, I am actually potentially treating a symptom of what could be a disease. So FDA says, can't say that. Because you might be convincing some consumer that your product is going to relieve their pain. And because the consumer thinks the product is going to relieve my pain, I don't have to go see a doctor. But some number of consumers out there probably should have really gone to see a doctor because maybe their pain is the result of something more serious. So now here's where regulatory compliance and marketing overlap a little bit. I'll pick another example. Sleep, huge topic in the market, right? Everybody's got a product for sleep, helps you sleep better, get a good night's sleep, right? Well, insomnia, which is a chronic inability to fall asleep, is officially a disease. And we're not allowed to treat diseases. We're not allowed to prevent diseases and we're not allowed to relieve diseases and we're not allowed to help with diseases. Those are all implied treatment claims or prevention claims. But you know what? 
everybody has trouble falling asleep from time to time. Maybe I ate a spicy meal at dinner. Maybe I had a cup of coffee at nine o'clock. Maybe I'm fighting with my wife or my boyfriend or my girlfriend or my kids, or I'm worried about how I'm going to pay my rent tomorrow, or I'm having problems in business, or I'm fighting with some, or whatever. Or I watched a horror movie and I've got nightmares about aliens coming to, you know, eat my brains while I'm sleeping. Everybody has problems falling asleep. That doesn't mean it's a disease. It could be just temporary stress. It could be aggravation. It could be worrying about what tomorrow is going to bring. Now, sure, when we get a good night's sleep, our bodies reset. And it's very healthy for us, right? But the reason people really need to get a good night's sleep is not for the sake of getting a good night's sleep. It's because tomorrow morning, you need to wake up feeling refreshed and focused and clear headed so that you can get your kids off to school and you can go to work and you can do the things that you need to do in the morning without being groggy, without feeling foggy and fuzzy and, you know, because you didn't sleep the night before. And so when we talk about products that are geared for sleep, I believe, and I've advised all my clients over the last decades, but what consumers really want is the ability to get the result, the benefit of getting a good night's sleep. So what's the benefit of getting a good night's sleep is waking up refreshed in the morning, right? What's the resulting benefit of not being in pain? I can garden. I can go on that bike ride. I can hike. I can take my kids to the soccer game. I can work out. I can do all the things that I want to do as a normal, healthy human being that I've been prevented from doing because, ow, it hurts. Oh, I can't bend over. Oh, I can't lift this. I can't open the jar, right? My arthritis is killing me. We're not allowed to talk about things like that. So from a marketing point of view and from a compliance point of view, if we can talk about what the consumer is really looking for, I call this the intent behind the intent. Sure, I want to be out of pain. Sure, I want to get a good night's sleep. But there's a reason for that. It's so that I can do the things that I enjoy doing in my life. I want to go biking. But I can't go biking if I'm in pain. I want to go to the gym and, and work out, but I can't do that if I'm in pain. I want to make breakfast for my kids and get them off to school. Or I want to go to work and, uh, you know, not worry about hurting myself in the office or in the factory or wherever it is I'm working or driving. Because I, I, I didn't sleep last night, so I'm falling asleep at the wheel. So if we talk about what people are able to do as a result of getting that good night's sleep, as a result of staying pain-free, we stay out of the higher level risk area of saying the wrong thing that's going to tick off the FDA. And we appeal better to consumers who want that positive image of getting the stuff done in their life they need to get done. You know, the Deche Act and the Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act and all the regulations, both around cannabis as well and CBD, are tens of thousands of pages. And they've been written in pieces. So you, you see that on page 172, it says, oh, your label must be blue. But then on page 641, it says, oh, your label cannot be blue. These regulations contradict themselves thousands of times. Well, what do you do? And that's a big issue. So what I tell my clients is the following. If we keep it simple, 
then we tend to stay safer, right? I'm going to throw one more thing at you. And this is a shocker. Every time I tell clients this, they get, what? Are you kidding me? No, that can't be true. There is a very misunderstood and somewhat lesser known regulation called the drug exclusion rule. And this is a real gotcha for CBD marketers. The drug exclusion rule says that when any substance is approved to be a prescription drug for any purpose, that substance can never be sold again without a prescription. So, for example, Shada, what prevents you and I from opening up a lab and manufacturing, pick one, insulin and selling an insulin supplement? Well, the fact that it's a prescription drug. Right. And because it's a prescription drug, we can't sell it without a prescription. Well, when the farm bill got signed, a pharmaceutical company called GW Pharmaceutical submitted to the FDA an application to do clinical trials. They got approved. They did the clinical trials. They submitted the results for a drug. The drug got approved. The drug is called Epidiolex. And it's for the treatment of some very rare forms of juvenile epilepsy. But Epidiolex is CBD. The moment GW Pharmaceutical got their approval for Epidiolex, from that moment forward, 100% of every CBD product sold in America from any source in any form, for any reason, became illegal to sell without a prescription. So today, 100% of every CBD product that's being sold in America without a prescription is illegal. Period. Now. Yeah, I need more information. How do you, how do you, you know, fight that if the market is so open and we're all selling CBD products? You just hit the answer right on the head. So what happened was when the drug exclusion rule was created, it was created to prevent people from producing what are really prescription product, penicillin, right? You can't go out and just make penicillin and market it. Why? Because it's a drug. It's an important drug. It fights, you know, bacterial infections. It helps save people's lives. And the FDA wants it to be manufactured in a very particular way with very strict safety standards and right. They weren't planning that CBD was going to come along. This drug exclusion rule, rule was written many years earlier. But then the farm bill gets signed. And all of a sudden, thousands and thousands and thousands of people said, oh, wow, I'm going to be the next CBD millionaire. I'm going to, CBD is now legal. I'm going to make CBD products and I'm going to sell them. And my cousin's going to sell them. And my cousin's dog is going to make them. And all of a sudden there were just hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of CBD products and CBD marketers and CBD manufacturers and white labelers all over the country. And the FDA saw this green gold rush as it's been called. And they said, Oh, my God, wow, the volume of CBD products being manufactured and the consumer demand for these types of products is so big that we can't just rush to judgment and shut them all down. So what the FDA did is they made a calculated decision. They said, we're going to take a step back. We are 
not going to actively enforce and take enforcement actions against CBD marketers based on the drug exclusion rule. Now, keep in mind, they could if they wanted to, but the demand was so overwhelming that who knows? I don't know. People may have marched in the street with you know, torches and pitchforks. So the FDA said, okay, we're not going to enforce based on the drug exclusion rule with one caveat. And that is that marketers of CBD products need to be fully compliant with everything else. Labels, marketing language, websites, social media content, reviews and testimonials, everything else has to be compliant and we won't come after you. So what did that do? Well, all of a sudden, literally overnight, that made compliance 8,000 times more important. Because if you could really stay compliant with labels and website language and claims and re reviews and testimonials and all of that stuff, if you could be compliant, you're probably not going to get an action from the FDA. There's another piece that I tell my clients. You and I. And a lot of marketers and a lot of consumers, when you hear the word or use the word advertising, you think of an ad, uh, something on TV or an ad I see on Facebook or on Instagram or Google, wherever I see the ads, right? But to the FDA and to the FTC, the word advertising means something different. It means the totality of everything a marketer does to get their message from point A, me, the marketer, to point B, you, the consumer. So every word on your website is advertising. Every word on your labeling of your product and your packaging is advertising. Every social media post that you do, whether it's paid or organic, it's advertising. Every review and testimonial is advertising. Every blog article is advertising. They do what's called a looking at total context. And it's all advertising. So in all of your advertising, you need to stay compliant. And that means there are things you cannot say as well as there are things you must say. And that depends on the type of the product. So if your product is a supplement, there are certain things you have to say and certain things you can't say. If your product is a topical, which falls under the cosmetic regulations, there are other things that you have to say and things that you have to say for supplements, you cannot say for topicals. So depending on the nature of what type of product it is, there are things you need to say and things you can't say. And it's reasonably complicated. You can't guess at it. You just dropped a lot of knowledge and probably created a lot more confusion for people of just, holy shit, we're doing things that, is it illegal? Is the FDA gonna come after me? Oh my God, I gotta go look back at all my social media posts, my website, my labeling, everything. But I have a couple clarifying questions. Sure. The first is just to you know highlight, I remember when Epidiolex got approved and I think there was a big scare internally as a business owner and just with the industry of, oh my God, to what you outlined. I sell a product that is now FDA approved. Does that mean they're going to, you know, eliminate the opportunity for me to sell my products? Obviously, you explained why it's just run rampant. They made a decision not to. But is there any discretion or discernment between? Because I know Epidiolex is an isolate-based CBD. 
does it just, or would it have just applied to isolate or would it have encompassed full spectrum as well? Just like anything CBD. That's a really, really good question. Um, the answer, which may not be a happy answer, is that it doesn't make any difference whether the product is an isolated broad spectrum mm. or a full spectrum. The molecule is CBD. So because it's present in anybody's product that they're marketing and selling, because it's an Epidiolex, that would automatically be a flag. It automatically makes the product technically, according to the black and white letter of the law, right. illegal. Lee. But the sheriff, the FDA, has said, we're not coming to town with our guns drawn, provided your labels are compliant, your website is compliant, your reviews and testimonials are compliant, and everything else you're doing is compliant, we won't come after you just because of the drug exclusion rule. Got it. Another follow-up I had is I want to get to talking about the FDA as an agency, especially in light of some of the recent administration's uh, vocalization about cannabis at large. But I want to put that aside for just a second and go back to some of the marketing positioning you were highlighting because that was a piece of information you shared in our one-on-one -on -one that we had a couple weeks ago. And I took it upon myself to also rope in my fiance to watch pharmaceutical ads on YouTube. And it was a very enlightening exercise because like, as you're explaining, you know, you don't want to talk about the negative. You don't want to remind somebody about their pain. You want to highlight what you can do. And it was crazy. I'm watching these drug commercials and it's a gal on a bike and it's a guy gardening. And I was like, son of a bitch, Marty, <laughs> Marty said this is the explicit, you know, way to do it, right? That's how they're getting these drugs to be able to be marketed. And it's just ever since we had that conversation, it's just been like a, a reframe in my mind. But the kind of follow up question to that is, and I know you specifically are speaking from the CBD perspective, and I think that's the smart way to look at it because hemp is federally legal and marijuana is not yet. But is there any, I guess, similarities probably more than not compared from CBD to something like THC? But the lines are now being blurred. And so I'm just looking at it like when people are selling recreational products, they're not necessarily saying, oh, it's because you're in pain or oh, because you want sleep. Like, yes, those are certain conversations. But I guess the point I'm asking is what is the sentiment from an FDA perspective about about recreation? Like, is that discussed? Is so, that frowned yeah, upon? That's a, it's that's a good question, Shada. And so the FDA doesn't really use the word recreation in their internal deliberations. They are more concerned with the word intoxicating. Okay. So, and because THC is intoxicating, how do you kind of market? And, and it does bleed into hemp because now we're able to sell Delta 8 and hemp derived Delta 9. And I know from a you know legislative perspective, yes, the semantics are both confusing and concerning depending on how the words are written and who's interpreting the words and where the words are placed. But it just is a very interesting thought because I look at CBD products probably having more leeway when it comes to marketing. Obviously, you see them being sold more direct to consumer so you can sell on a website. Marijuana products have a little bit more gatekeeping and so therefore I just don't see them as blatantly being marketed in the same capacity and also marketing THC is intoxicating. So it's kind of hard to not talk about the intoxicating effects because you want people to know what they're getting, right? Sure, sure. So I'm going to take this from a little bit of an outside direction come circling into your question. Perfect. The cannabis market in North America is not in great shape today. Look at the biggest of the cannabis companies in Canada, 
where it was federally legalized first. They're not doing very well. Their stocks are down in the toilet. Why? Because when they came to market, they said, oh, my God, cannabis is legalized here. So let's get as many square feet under grow as possible. And let's dominate the market. And what they didn't really do very well was calculate what the consumer demand was going to be. So here it is a year, two years, three years later, and there was more product grown then there was consumer demand for it. So a lot of it went to waste. And a lot of these companies are getting slaughtered in the marketplace. And the investors that invested in those companies are getting their asses kicked. In the U.S., cannabis is still federally illegal. And so here we have the first of a series of head scratchers. Like, what are we supposed to do? Now, federal law supersedes state law. State laws are allowed to be more restrictive than than federal laws, but they're not allowed to be more permissive. So if the federal law says, no, you are not allowed to wear a blue shirt, you can't really have a state saying blue shirts are legal here because federal law trumps state law. And so because federal law still hasn't descheduled cannabis. Depending on how friendly the political environment of a given state is to the current federal administration and to Congress, they're either going to get a lot of crap or a little bit of crap or no crap from the feds. So you know the old expression, follow the money, right? Cannabis is a big market. It's a growing market. It's going to continue to grow. But what's going to happen in my estimation in the cannabis space is fairly similar to what has happened in almost every other space, in almost any other product space. You go into your dispensary. They got 42 different strains available. And one of them says purple haze. Is it really? How do you know? Just because they wave a piece of paper at you and show you a COA? How do you know the lab that did it wasn't owned by their uncle? So there's going to be a lot of fallout over the next year or two in terms of transparency. As cannabis regulations get sorted out, and they will, testing requirements are going to get a lot more significant. Transparency is going to become a lot more significant. Potency is going to become a huge issue. You got a family, you got kids, you go in the car, you take your kids in the car, Do you want to really wonder whether every driver around you is drunk and inebriated and potentially going to nod off and cross the line and kill you? No. So the concept of intoxication is where the emphasis is today. Now, how do you reduce the risks of intoxication? You start creating restrictions. Okay, you can buy cannabis, but you can't drive with it. Well, look at what's happened in the last two years. 
police officer pulls over somebody, their car is weaving a little bit, they smell something. The guy says, oh, no, this isn't weed. This is hemp. Well, the poor police officer who just pulled you over has no way to tell the difference. There's no on-the-spot test. Oh, let me take this. Looks like a joint, smells like a joint, but you know, is it legal hemp or is it cannabis? Or who knows, right? There's no way to tell today. So things like that are going to become very big issues. And I think what we're going to see, and I can't guarantee this, but I think what we're going to see is severe restrictions on potency. I think we're going to see more restrictions on how and where you can use or possess. Um, quantities in possession. I think we're going to see more stringent regulations about testing requirements, lab certifications, um, maybe even multiple lab certifications, testing at different points, testing at the point of planting, testing mid-harvest, testing at the point of harvest. I think there's going to be a lot of new things coming that we're not prepared for today. And yeah, it's going to be a lot more expensive for the average cannabis marketer, cannabis grower, cannabis seller, dispensary, which is why MSOs and which is why the big giant, you know, publicly traded cannabis companies have an advantage because they can afford to do things that are out of the price range of the average marketer. I personally don't have the money to go and hire some of these labs, or if I had to, by law, get three lab tests on every batch of every product, it put me out of business. So I think we're going to see a lot of confusion over the next couple of years. I think the emphasis is going to be on three things. Testing and transparency, intoxication levels, so, yes, you can have up to X percent THC content. And I think there's going to be an absolute bloodbath in synthetics. I think it's going to for sure get worse before it gets better. And I yep. don't disagree with everything you highlighted. In fact, I've been a really big, I guess, advocate is maybe the right word I'll use in this setting. But the more I ingrain myself in the industry, especially being on the hemp CBD side of things, where we do have federal legality, and it is so messy for everything you just mentioned, it makes it really difficult for me to believe that we're getting federal legalization of marijuana anytime soon without addressing what's going on in the hemp space and so that's where I think a lot of people are more hopeful, are more uh, gullible to have politics. Obviously, Biden's recent statement sparked a lot of excitement for the industry. I think, you know, at a baseline level, it is exciting to see it being discussed at a federal level. But mm -hmm. to me, I'm very much in agreement with what you just outlined, testing first and foremost, the discrepancies from a testing perspective. It's sure. outrageous. And so to kind of, you know, follow up with the point I was going to bring up earlier, the FDA as an agency, it's very interesting to hear that they did not want to move forward with, I guess, you know, acting on the issue of there being a conflict between all these brands going to market with CBD and Epidiolex. On the reverse side of that, I just got back from DC recently. This was my first time in DC, my first time lobbying at a federal level on hemp. And we were talking to the House, talking to the Senate. We talked to both the House and Senate ag. We 
we're having conversations specifically around three bills, and I'm sure you're familiar with them. I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but I'll include them in the show notes for the listeners. Two are on qualifying hemp as a dietary supplement and as a food and beverage additive ingredient. And then like the third bill is the culmination of both of those in the Senate. Sure. And a lot of the conversations though were, you know, you're trying to get the House to vote, you're trying to get the Senate to vote and put pressure on the FDA. And then most of them are saying, oh, the FDA is not going to budge. The FDA is not going to, they're not going to make a statement that you can put this in food. They're not going to put this in a dietary supplement. So keep in mind, keep in mind, there is, and whether we're all in this industry and we all want certain things to happen, you know, wishes and hopes don't make things happen. Right? Absolutely. And there are realities that we as professionals and business people and good corporate citizens of the world we want some level of fairness, right? So if it's good for you, it's good for me, right? Equality, inclusion. Um, there are so many issues where if it's good for the goose, it's good for the gander. It's got to be, there's got to be some level playing fields here someplace, right? For sure. Otherwise, we have nothing but chaos and anarchy. So when you talk about changing regulations, it's not as easy as we would like to think. Yes, change the regulations for CBD hemp to make it okay to put it in foods. Yeah, but when you take one step back, you realize it's opening up a much bigger can of worms. Yeah. And here's the problem. Foods exist legally because our bodies need nutrition to survive. Simple. Food and beverage, we need hydration, we need protein, we need carbohydrates, we need a certain amount of fats, we need, we need these things to live. Our bodies need them to function. That's why foods are legal. And they're regulated so that they're safe. So they have expiration dates. So I can't go to the supermarket and buy milk that expired three months ago and die from it. So there's a regulation that says anything added to a food, which includes a beverage, foods and beverages, the same category, anything added to a food or a beverage, any ingredient that isn't purely for nutritional value must have GRAS status. CBD does not have GRAS status. And until it does get it, which is not in the near future, it will be illegal to add CBD to a food or a beverage. Is that, just to clarify, and GRAS stands for generally regarded as safe, just for listeners. Correct. For that status, is that, like, I'm playing it out in my head, should that be the bill that people are trying to introduce versus jumping to have it being added into food and beverages? Or sure, is it kind only, of encompassed in the bill that no, we're no, trying No, you're to correct. The only legal path to allow any CBD to be infused into a food or a beverage would be to give it GRAS status because that automatically allows it to be added to foods and beverages. You don't need any other laws. Why are people not pursuing that then, if that's... Because it's harder than it sounds. Oh no, 100%, I understand that part. But on the, I guess, uh, just dissecting of how the policy works, it's it just is remarkable to watch hemp being federally legal, but it's obviously very loosely regulated at a federal level mm -hmm. and now there's all these interpretations and then people who are trying to be in compliance with what they think the fda is or isn't based on what you were sharing earlier too obviously if you're doing a topical you look at cosmetics there is a little bit of you know assumption that can be made from a professional perspective and and it's like the fda it's just weird hearing that they know people are operating to kind of bring it back in full circle 
It's weird that they know people are operating. They don't want to take action on people who are making products that are similar to an FDA approved drug. But then when we're asking for clarity and regulation, they're kind of like, no, we don't want to deal with it now. We don't want to have that conversation. Like, I know it's going to come eventually. I know it's not as fast as people want it to be. I always um, hope that my guesstimations are wrong. I love being proved wrong, but I also spend a lot of time having these conversations and exploring these topics that I arrived to the same destination as you of it's going to take some time. And here's the laundry list of why. I mean, even just talking to the House and Senate members, we're going in for these three bills on food and beverage, dietary supplement. And then they're asking us, oh, well, you know, what about the THC percentage? What about testing? And they start pulling out all the other little threads and unravel and you're like, yep, mm -hmm, it's a much bigger boulder to be moving than just a flip of a switch. We want legalization or we want you to approve this bill or whatever the case may be. There are so many segments of interest that when you go to Congress, and you ask for 83 things to be done, right? none of them get done. If the industry went to Congress and got its act together and said, we want these two things addressed, there's an infinitely greater chance that those two things could get addressed. But there are special interests where a certain part of the market is mostly concerned about food and beverage and another part of the market is concerned about um, potency level and another part of the market is concerned about testing and ISO standards and another part of the market is concerned about claims being made and Deshay supplement products. Uh, you can't get everything done at the same time. First of all, Congress doesn't have the focus. They don't have the time. They don't have the money. And I always say follow the money. 85% of the FDA's entire operating budget is funded by Big Pharma. Hello? I know. When the FDA has to pick who's my best friend. I know. <laughs> who's my best friend? My best friend is Big Pharma. Because they pay my salary. So we have to be realistic here. We have to... This industry has to get its shit together and it's got to focus on one or two critical things that move the needle in the right direction, get those done, and then take the next two or three things. And if this industry doesn't come together and start to police itself, then all we're going to do is ask for someone else to step in and police, right? Because when I see websites, uh, particularly a lot of the MLM websites and the white label websites in the CBD space, those are the reasons why we can't have the good things that we should have. The gas station brands, the brands being sold and, you know, resellers. It's, yeah, it's look they... At the, look at all the investigational reports done by dozens of television networks across the country and media across the country where they went out, secret shopper, they bought 30 brands of CBD tinctures, they had them independently tested, and 92% of them came back not even close to what the label said. And now we're marching on Congress with torches and pitchforks saying, make it legal, make it legal. And Congress is saying, are you kidding me? I know. It's very eye-opening. You guys can't even put out a product, honestly. And you're telling us it's our fault? That's crazy. That's insane. It's very uncomfortable to live in this reality where you like just being there real like realizing it in person that these conversations i'm not saying they're not important to have but i agree that the industry needs to do a better job of self-regulating of figuring out what is the next best thing and i think we're a little kind of all over the place from just a hemp perspective, which is why I think it's going to be even more complicated to go after federal legalization of marijuana, of full cannabis. I think 
it becomes impossible to come up with an answer until the question is properly phrased. It's a great point. I don't think this industry has its questions properly phrased yet. Some are close, some are closer than others, but everybody has their own unique, you know, selfish interests at heart, which is fine. But this industry is very fragmented. There are a lot of egos at play. There's a lot of money at stake. And it makes people crazy. People turn on their best friends over money. It's ridiculous, right? Um, we have to stop stabbing each other in the back and doing stupid things. And we have to come together as an industry to make a happier planet, a healthier planet, to help people live happier, healthier lives, and to get quality products. If I say my product has X in it, it better have X in it. Because otherwise, all I'm doing is contributing to somebody else's reason to come after the industry. It's very well said. And so I take a, you know, a, a point of view of saying we can get it done. Cannabis can be descheduled. It is criminal. It is nothing short of criminal that on Monday, someone gets found guilty of possession of, of, of weed and goes to jail for 20 years. But on the following Tuesday, it gets legalized in a certain state and companies come in and make tens of millions or hundreds of millions of dollars. And the fact that intergenerational wealth is being created while the guy who just got convicted a right. week before it became legal is spending the rest of his life in jail, there's a problem here. Absolutely. That's only one problem. Right. There are people who create knowingly false products, false advertising, false marketing, false claims, taking advantage of the public. I see it, especially in the CBD side. I mean, I just hear and I mean, see here brands that just they want to get in, make a quick buck, especially on the vape side. They just inject the market with really shitty vape products, sell it to, mm -hmm. you know, underage kids who don't question the integrity of what's inside of it. And then to your point, you know, these investigative reporters, you hear the scare stories and it's ripping the industry apart. And oh, these products aren't safe. And it's no, it's bad actors and yeah. we need more regulation and, and all these things. So everything you're saying is so timely and- We could shade us spend the next month. I know. And not even scratch the surface of all the things that really need to be discussed. Because every one of these points deserves its own. Absolutely. You know, attention and its own expertise coming in. And there's just so much to talk about. And I, and I know we've already run over time, but. No, these are important things to be bringing up. That's my whole hope with this podcast and this platform is to start chipping away at some of these questions to get at, you know, the big question and to really inspire people to figure out what they care about, if they care at all, how to make change, who to listen to, who not to listen to. Right. Um, it's just the, there's just too much excitement and people don't live in reality, unfortunately. So one of the reasons that I really wanted to do this podcast with you is because you're one of the people on the, on the side of, of righteousness here. Um, opening these conversations, helping the industry understand the issues, you know, bringing sunlight is the best disinfectant, right? And we may not agree with things, but that doesn't make them not true. Absolutely. So if we can address the truth, if we can have an intelligent conversation, and just because two people may disagree, they don't have to be enemies. Conversation, debate, gets us further down the road towards towards the finish line. And, you know, I hope that what we talked about today is of help to some of the listeners. I am absolutely available to answer questions if 
people want to get in touch or, you know, ask you, you know how to reach me at any time, Shada, we're in touch. Uh, I'd be very happy to come back and do another session on a different topic if you wanted. At any time, I have massive respect for what you're doing. Thank you. And would love to continue to support you. Um, I'm going to throw something out for your audience, if I may. Please do. The mic is okay. yours. Mentioned at the beginning that I've taken on the role as CEO and president of a hemp smokable company. It's a smokable alternative company because one of the enemies to health is tobacco and nicotine. 30 million people in America smoke cigarettes every day. 1.8 billion people worldwide smoke tobacco cigarettes every day. You know what? For the last 50, 60 years, the message about nicotine and tobacco and lung cancer and heart disease, it's been out there. These people didn't miss the message, but they're smoking. Why are they smoking? They're smoking because of the same reason people do anything. Because it gives them something. Solves a need, fulfills a desire. They like the rituals. You know, I'm feeling sad, I'll have a smoke. I'm feeling depressed, I'll get a pick-me-up. Um, I'm out with my friends, they're smoking. Yeah, I'll grab one, right? People have reasons why they smoke. So I've taken over the role of CEO and president of a hemp smoke company called Mountain Smokes at mountainsmokes.com. And we make an amazing product. It truly is. Don't take my word for it. And the reason you don't have to take my word for it is because... The only way to really know is not to let me tell you it's good. It's for you to try it. So we've made a decision to give away a free pack of Mountain Smokes to anybody in the United States that wants one. If you go to mountainsmokes.com, you'll see an opportunity to get a free pack. And it's our pleasure to give you a free pack. And I wanted to leave everybody with that. By all means, if I tell you thousands and thousands and thousands of people have flipped out about how good it is, how smooth it is, how great it tastes. So we've made the decision that to do the right thing for the marketplace, if you've ever had a hemp smoke before and you taste one of ours, it's game over. Yeah, I'm excited me. to try your products and appreciate the just like depth of the conversation that we were able to have today. It's nice to end on a little bit of a, you know, high note, a positive note. So thank yeah, you for that offer. A gift for your listeners. No, they, I'm sure they appreciate mm -hmm. it, but really thank you for just openly sharing. And like you said, having a discussion, having a dialogue, I Hope my listeners and audience knows that nothing is ever, you know, explicitly a line drawn in the sand. It's clear, even from an FDA perspective, they're contradicting themselves in their own regulations. So it's not that you shouldn't try to do the right thing, that you absolutely should, but also understand that this is a very new industry. Things are still figuring out their place and their time. And the best thing that we can do is absolutely stay hopeful keep staying involved, continue advocating, but ask questions and have conversations. So thanks again, Marty, for the discussion today. I know I learned a lot and I'm sure the listeners did as well. My pleasure entirely, Shada, to be here. And as I said, if any of your listeners have any questions or they're not sure about something, please ask them to get in touch with you. You know how to reach me. I will respond as intelligently and as promptly as I possibly can. Thank you for that. I absolutely will let them know how to find you.